It's very good to see you, and thank you so much for the introduction, Amy. Uh, this place is beautiful. I haven't been in this room before, so this is very nice. Um, this stuff is super exciting to me, not just because it's based on my own research, but because I think that even though I'm a historian, and sometimes my stuff doesn't seem to have anything to do with what's going on in the present, I think, in fact, this story does. This story is a story that continues to have resonances even to today. Big resonances. So hopefully I'll get into some of those today. All right, so the story actually starts... Let's see if I hit the right button. Nope, I got to hit that. I think it was about eight years ago, I had a, a student come up to me after class, and he said, Dr. Peterson, if there was one book that sort of changed the way that we see ourselves what we are as, as humans, how biologists, how scientists see us as humans, what would be that book? And I said, oh, well, it's, it's clearly this book right here. It's clearly The Descent of Man by Charles Darwin. How wrong I was. And I'm happy to say that I was completely wrong and that I have recanted. There is a far more important book, a little bit older, than Charles Darwin's Descent of Man. In fact, so important that Charles Darwin wrote Descent of Man in order to combat this book. It's nothing that Darwin wrote at all that's that important to this debate. It's a book by this man, Josiah Clark Knott of Mobile, Alabama, who wrote this book, The Types of Mankind. Now, he was not the only author. He had a whole bunch of authors. But primarily, it was him that was running the show, pulling in even people like Louis Agassiz. Louis Agassiz was the Neil deGrasse Tyson or the Carl Sagan. There's somebody from my generation. That level of scientific speaker. Louis Agassiz was the most famous geologist in world history. He was Swiss and slummed it to come to the United States to teach at Harvard. Think about that. <laughs> so, not even pulls in Louis Agassiz into this gigantic project. And this book, Types of Mankind, far outsells anything that Charles Darwin would write during his lifetime. So it's an extremely important book, and I want to tell you a little bit about the book and about the man. Again, he was in, not from Alabama, but was working in Alabama when he writes the book. And what role this plays, not only in arguments in the 19th century, clearly in the past, but arguments that have these resonances, these ripples that come up even to right now. Let me tell you a little bit about, oh, the other thing I should say right at the beginning is there is a building named after him on our campus at the University of Alabama. Here's the building in the 1920s, actually it's late, early 1930s, before there is a name on the building, and at the time it was just called the medical building. Eventually medicine would move to UAB, as you know. And this building would be used. Now it houses our Honors College, and it is not Hall. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Not. He's not actually an Alabaman by birth. He was born in Charleston, South Carolina. His father was a judge, one of the most prominent justices in all of South Carolina. Um, their family friends were the Calhouns. So if you've heard of John C. Calhoun, who was vice president, basically ran the Senate for 30 years, the Knots and the Calhouns were friends of each other. So very tight with some of the biggest, most powerful families in the entire United States. Um, he gets his uh, MD from what is now uh, University of Pennsylvania, at the time called like the Jefferson School of Medicine. Um, that was the only really good medical school in the entire United States. Uh, he, he recognized early on that if you wanted to be a real doctor, not just the kind of doctors you have in America, but a real doctor in the middle of the 19th century, you had to go to Europe. And so he goes and he studies in Paris. He goes to Edinburgh. University of Edinburgh had the greatest medical school in the entire world at the time, the only place that you could do really hardcore anatomy and physiology work. And so Knott goes there. And by all accounts, he was a very excellent student. Um, he got along with all of his professors. He went and did extra work. He was very good. He was very good at medicine. Uh, he eventually comes back first to, to Charleston, tries to, to do private practice, doesn't really go anywhere. And so then he ends up moving to Mobile uh, after his daughter died, interestingly enough. Why Mobile? Well, it wasn't New Orleans. That's where he wanted to go. 
But New Orleans was, was full with another knot. His older brother, Gustafson Knott, was already teaching at the medical college in New Orleans, so he couldn't go there. So he had to go to the second best city that he could find, Mobile. Mobile was great for him for a second reason. Gambling was legal, and nobody got angry with you if you were a physician who made a great deal of money. Nobody feared that you were bilking your clients. To be a physician in the early 19th century, as you probably know from watching Little House on the Prairie and things like that back in the day, usually meant making house calls. And it usually also meant establishing a kind of clientele. And if you could make wealthy clients, you yourself could get pretty wealthy, but then people worried that you were maybe creating diseases for them to have so that you could continue to treat them. And, and Mobile seemed to be a little bit more relaxed about that. The other thing that he is known for is in 1858 calling on uh, other physicians in South Alabama, but also Mississippi and Georgia, and finally getting a medical college here in the state of Alabama in 1858. But he only really teaches there from 58 to 59, and then the war comes, and the medical college has to sort of shutter its doors. In fact, it becomes a, a place where other men are being trained medicine still, but now battlefield medicine, not the kind of medicine that Knott was used to. Knott and his sons all enlist uh, in the medical corps, the Confederate medical corps, and at the end of the war are treated with distinction, but then don't end up living in Alabama anymore. And we'll get to why that is toward the end. All right, let me tell you a little bit about why Mobile. Why Mobile was attractive. Not because of Betty Davis, but um, Mobile was one of the cities where tropical diseases came every single year. The, the tropical disease season was actually predictable in the 19th century. As soon as Veracruz, Mexico had its first outbreak of yellow fever, you had about four months before it hit Mobile in New Orleans. So yellow fever was a, was a constant scourge along the Gulf Coast. And primarily what Knott does as a physician in the 19th century is treat people during these tropical disease outbreaks. But he also has this very wealthy clientele. Um, in 1853, one of the pieces of information that we know about Knott's life, and there, there actually isn't that much left over of his life. All of his papers are destroyed, except for two letters. Um, but what we do know is that in 1853, there's this massive outbreak that kills about 8,000 people in New Orleans is terrifying. People see this as the end of days. They're afraid the entire city of Mobile is going to get wiped out. Um, this is what ends up being made into the film Jezebel. That's the backdrop for the film Jezebel. And in this outbreak in 1853, Knott loses three children within a period of about two weeks to yellow fever. So it's pretty serious. And he will forever try to pursue ways to treat yellow fever. Now that leads to a rumor about Knott's life and a reason for extolling Knott as this model, big name physician important for the state of Alabama, which turns out not to be true. He writes this article in 1840, Yellow Fever Contrasts with Bilious Fever or Bilious Fever. Um, and in this article, he suggests that yellow fever is not caused by garbage. Okay, <laughs> that doesn't sound that weird, or maybe it does. The going, the going explanation for disease was called miasma theory. And miasma theory goes something like this. You get sick because of the environment. Literally, the environment makes you sick. And if you live in an unhealthy environment, you are going to get sick a lot more often. So the way to combat unhealth is through public health. Clean up the streets. Take the garbage off the streets. Empty the cesspools if you can. Make living healthy and you won't get sick. But not said, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't think about disease that way. Instead, he says, yellow fever is spread by these tiny little parasites that crawl up from the beach in Mobile and then they bite you and they put their poison in you and that is how you get sick. Now, in the 20th century, some people interpreted this as a revolutionary new understanding of disease and wanted to say that what Josiah not discovered is that mosquitoes are the vector for yellow fever. And so Knott was made into this big figure during the course of the early 20th century, a person that we really should extol because he figured out yellow fever, but it turns out to be completely untrue. 
He did not know anything about mosquito vectors. He thought that yellow fever was literally poison spread by bugs that were coming up from the beach. But that's closer. That's closer. So if you've heard of Josiah not before, and you've heard of him as this kind of model physician, it's usually for this. It turns out Walter Reed will discover the mosquito vector of yellow fever many years later. He did not, in fact, discover this mos mosquito vector idea. And during Knott's lifetime, he was famous, but he wasn't famous for this. Nobody pulled out the yellow fever stuff and said, aha, see, this is why he's significant. But he was significant. So why? That's what my research was trying to go into. Let's go back to the beginning, the very beginning, the Adam and Eve beginning. If you were to be in Alabama or basically anywhere else in the United States in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, and you ask somebody, what's the story of humans? Where do humans come from? The vast majority of people, even scientists, would have said that there was this pair of people, one named Adam and one named Eve, and even if that wasn't their names, it doesn't matter. There was this original pair, and all of us, all of us come from them. Doesn't matter what you look like on the outside, we all have a common pair of ancestors, Adam and Eve. That's what almost everybody would have said. So according to scripture, in the 1820s and 30s and 40s, all of us are related. And in the United States, something interesting was going on in about the 1820s and 1830s. An enormous rise in denominations that called themselves evangelical. Evangelical because they thought that the Bible was the word of God and that if you wanted to know something about anything in religion or in how to live your life, you had to consult the Bible. So more and more and more people were reading the Bible on a regular basis and thinking that the stories that the Bible tells are literally the word of God, including the Adam and Eve story. More and more people, therefore, are thinking that we all are related because we all come from Adam and Eve. But there was a competing explanation. Not the religious explanation, interestingly enough. Monogenism didn't have to be just religious. Monogenism is just the notion that we all come from one set of ancestors. So the biblical story is monogenic, but it wasn't just the biblical story. There were scientists that were trying to demonstrate this at the same time. The most famous of all was a man named James Cowles Pritchard in, the, in England, in the UK. I like this picture because he signs it, your affectionate father right here, so he must have been a good dad. Pritchard was trying to establish monogenism, but from data other than just the biblical story. It's not that he thought the Bible was wrong, necessarily. He just thought there was a whole lot of evidence that showed that, indeed, people are all related to each other. Pritchard founded an entire field called ethnography in order to study all the differences in people all around the world, but to show how all of those differences actually pointed toward common heritage, whether it was in language or dress or dance or governmental systems or how we arrange our families. He said, it doesn't matter. All the scientific evidence, just like the Bible itself, says that we're all related. Any difference that you see is superficial. The similarity is far more important than the difference. And in fact, he publishes this book called Researches into the Physical History of Mankind. And it is a massive manual. It starts off as two volumes, and he revises it and revises it. And by the time he dies, it is five volumes, five huge volumes of all of the evidence to demonstrate scientifically why all humans must have a common ancestor, why we are all actually related to each other, and why any difference that you see is important but superficial, that really the commonality is the, is the fact of the matter, and that is monogenism. But I mentioned a second ago that there was a competing explanation. Polygenism. Oh, I didn't get to that slide yet. I should say that they started this big journal, the Journal of the Ethnological Society of London in 1848. A whole field of ethnography gets formulated around this notion that we can demonstrate that people are all related to each other. 
And you can see the kinds of work that they did. A lot of it was traveling around the world and finding out stuff about other cultures, some existing, some long gone, documenting all the stuff. But then the point is, and you can see it right here where Pritchard gives his address himself, the relations of ethnology to other branches of knowledge, the whole point is to demonstrate how we all think alike even if we act different. We all speak in similar ways even if our languages are slightly different. And no matter what our skin color is, we're all related. But there was an opposing position called polygenism. Polygenism is old. But polygenism resurged in the 1700s, the 18th century. And it really started to get teeth in the early 19th century. Polygenism is just the opposite of monogenism. Instead of saying we all have a single ancestor, polygenism says we have many ancestors. How many? Well, usually that number is either four or five. Either four or five based on these characteristics. Most notably, your skin and your hair, but also your bone structure and your face and your language and the kinds of behaviors that you do and the kinds of food that you eat and your sort of cultural stuff. Polygenism, again, wasn't really supported with biblical evidence, and the vast majority of scientific evidence was all on the side of monogenism, but there were a few renegades, a few rebels, a few revolutionaries that really thought that polygenism was the right story. One of them was a guy in Philadelphia named Samuel George Morton. He was affiliated with the Pennsylvania School of Medicine, the one that Josiah Knott went to. In fact, he knew not personally. And Morton, man, Morton liked heads, or more specifically skulls. He really liked skulls. And he had a lot of friends that also apparently liked skulls. And he got skulls sent to him from all over the world. One of his favorite people to work with was a man named George Glidden. George Glidden was a British man that worked in the American consulate in Cairo and on the weekends apparently grave robbed, <laughs> no lie, and took heads from mummies and then shipped them to Philadelphia. But that's not all. Morton also had another friend, Ephraim Squire, who was just at that moment walking across Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana and finding all these mounds and digging down into these mounds and find, finding other heads and shipped those heads to Philadelphia too. Samuel George Morton compiled the largest skull collection in human history. He had over 900 skulls of people from all over the world. He never had to even leave his home. He just got to stack them up in his basement? I don't know. I don't know if they knew about serial killers then, but I'm pretty sure that would have been... <laughs> An indicator. So Morton had this massive skull collection, and one of the things that Morton tried to show in his skull collection is that the human face and the non-human primate face share certain similarities with each other that from Morton's perspective belied not the common ancestry of humans and apes, full stop, but the common ancestry of certain humans and apes. But Morton died prematurely. And Morton's skull collection was going to be scattered to the wind. By the way, the skull collection does still exist, and it is still at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, if you ever want to go see it. Um, the skulls were going to be dispersed. His family didn't know what to do with a basement full of skulls anyway. So what to do, what to do, what to do? Well, just before he dies, he knows he's going to die, Samuel Morton writes to a former student of his, a man named Josiah Clark Knott, and says, I have to get rid of my skull. Do you want them? And Knott says, the only problem, Sam, is that you never went far enough in your work. You never went far enough in your work. What Josiah Clark Knott was known for during his lifetime, and in the decades after his lifetime, had nothing to do with yellow fever, nothing to do with curing it, nothing to do with being a physician. He was known from Mobile to Paris, France to Berlin for being a race theorist. In fact, the champion of polygenism on planet Earth. He took all those skulls, and he didn't stop there. He had George Glidden get him more. 
And over the years, you can see that he continued to write about this stuff ever more fervently in 1844. He starts his crusade to be a race theorist. He writes this big one, The Natural History of Mankind in Connection with Negro Slavery, presented in, in the end of 1850 and published in 1851 at the, at the University of Alabama. Then he writes Types of Mankind in 1854, which I'll talk more about in a second. Even at the end of his life, he's still writing this stuff. This book, The Moral and Intellectual Diversity of Races, this one's a special one. Uh, it's actually not written by Knott, it's written by a guy named Arthur Gobineau, who was a French count who wrote basically the same stuff, polygenism. But this book translates Gobineau's French work into English and happens to be the book that gets retranslated into German in 1923. And then a certain man, a certain Austrian man named Adolf Hitler reads it in prison and says, oh, <laughs> other people think like me too. Oops, I skipped over that. These are actually all the works that Josiah not writes on race stuff. He was very prolific. He wrote a lot. And as he wrote more, he realized he was rubbing up against a dominant position, especially in Mobile, Alabama, held by a lot of really prominent people, which was monogenism, which lots and lots of religious people held in Mobile, Alabama. And he said, so if I really want people to be polygenists, I can't just present the race evidence. I can't just present skulls. I also must, must, must attack the veracity of Scripture. If I don't do that, nobody is going to buy it. So Josiah Knott also takes that on. We'll talk about that in a second. The Types of Mankind is a 900-page book, lavishly illustrated, published in 1854. It was so expensive that you had to take out a, a subscription. You had to pay half of the book up front and then pay the other half to actually get it. It was just an extremely uh, expensive book to produce. And it had most of the heavy hitters in race theory around the planet that Knott was able to organize to do this book. Color illustrations were almost unheard of at the time, and yet this book uh, features not one, not two, but 16 fold-out color illustrations. It was an extremely expensive book. One of the most important ones, the one that gets republished and republished and republished and republished even through the 20th century, is this one. So what's going on in this diagram is a full polygenist worldview. What Nod is saying is that there are these sort of ecosystems, these sort of niches, we would call them now, on planet Earth, full of animals. You know, rhinoceri don't live at the North Pole. They live in only one particular part of the world. And so, says Not and his co-authors, it is logical to believe that there are humans that are designed for certain parts of the world and nowhere else. And they, just like the animals, must have had an origin in that spot, which means... It doesn't matter that we all have five fingers and five toes. It doesn't matter that we look so similarly under the skin. Those differences that the monogenists said were superficial, Josiah not says, absolutely not. Though, I didn't mean to make a pun. <laughs> Those are real. Those are real differences. Those are the important differences. And again, this is, this is a widely read, republished, sent around the world, argued over, and very pretty expensive book, accompanied by this map where Louis Agassiz, the big Swiss science star, the biggest scientist on the planet at the time, designs an entirely new way of thinking about how humans are related or not to each other. And again, whenever a, this is actually called biogeography, and whenever a biogeography class is taught, through the middle of the 20th century, they always start with this map. It's a whole system. And it's a scientific system. At least they said that it was. Whoops, why does this keep skipping ahead? Josiah Knott wasn't content to just say people were different, though. He and Agassiz were convinced that the earth wasn't going to just be sort of stagnant with everybody living in peace with one another in their little geographic zones. People from European descent, people with light-colored skin, were already, for hundreds of years, going around the world and subjugating everybody else. And not said that the reason why that was, 
because this is progress. This is the way that this stuff is supposed to work. All human progress has arisen from the war of races. One color person versus another color person until only one is left. The, all the conquests, all the colonizations, these are good. Certain races would be stationary and barbarous forever. Unless other people went to their territory and made it so that they had to live a different way. Or die. This is what Josiah not promotes in this book. And in fact, this, this message is so powerful, a whole other field is developed to promote it. A whole other field is promoted to develop this. So Pritchard, the guy I talked about before, he was an ethnographer, and he founds the Ethnological Society of London in order to promote monogenism. That society, I should have said, was, comes out of what's called the Aboriginal Protection Society, which were the abolitionists in the UK long before there was such a thing in the US. And one of the most important monogenists in the Ethnological Society of London was a man named Charles Darwin. And he had a bunch of friends who were in it too. And they were relatively wealthy and they sponsored expeditions around the world. That's how everybody got to India and Polynesia and South Africa in order to collect all their data. They paid out of their own pockets to send people there. So Darwin himself was an explicit monogenist. And this was a wealthy, powerful, scientific society until types of mankind comes out. In 1854, arguments start, real arguments, like punch each other in the face arguments. And British don't punch each other very often. They just say snarky things. <laughs> And by 1863, especially in the middle of the American Civil War, the fighting is so fierce that a group of people split off. They say, we don't want to do ethnography anymore. We're going to do anthropology. We're going to call it anthropology. It's going to do some of the same things, except that it's going to emphasize polygenism, not monogenism anymore. One of the first big things that comes out, well, the, the sort of publication that demonstrates the split of the group is written by a guy named James Hunt. I guess you're probably not going to be able to read this very easily. James Hunt, and it's called A Negro's Place in Nature. And he's explicit. The field of anthropology is going to be about white supremacy. That's what it's going to be about. And if you doubt it, all of our publications are going to be about white supremacy. So the Anthropological Society of London is going to be founded, and anthropology as a field is going to be founded upon these principles right here. There's so much difference between blacks and whites. Much more difference than between humans and non-human apes. Much more difference. The Negro is inferior intellectually. The Negro is more humanized when he is subordinate. This is Britain, not the United States. Britain's already had abolition for 45 years at the point that this is written, and the United States is just trying it out in 1863. But it's the only way that the Negro race can be humanized and civilized. They have to be slaves to Europeans. These are scientists. These are not slave owners. These are people in Britain, not the United States. And yet, and yet, the Anthropological Society of London becomes far more popular far more quickly. And eventually, the Ethnographic Society of London has to shut down. They can't get enough membership. Even Charles Darwin, discouraged as he is, ends up stop coming to meetings. So Darwin writes Origin of Species in 1859, and he says nothing about humans until the last sentence of the book, where he, just, he merely says, this might shed light on humans. But that's it. People pressed him right away. They said, come on, man. You got to finish this book. You got to write more. Darwin admitted the origin of the species was just an abstract. It wasn't his big book. The first of his big books comes out in 1868, and it's about the variation in plants and animals. And the second of the trilogy is Descent of Man in 1871. But the reason why it takes him so long to write Descent of Man is because he realizes that the point of even writing this book isn't really to talk about the origins of humans anymore. It's to talk about where race comes from and how there can be races and yet still monogenism. He explicitly writes this book because he's watched over the past decade 
as even close friends, have been seduced by polygenism, seduced to becoming anthropologists. And so finally he's motivated to write this book to show, look, there's no scientific evidence for polygenism. There's no scientific evidence for polygenism. But in order to do that, Darwin has to invent a new mechanism by which evolution happens. Origin of Species is about natural selection. But in the third edition of the Origin of Species, Darwin has a conversation with a frenemy, a guy who's sort of a friend, sort of an enemy. His name is Herbert Spencer. And Herbert Spencer says, dude, you basically wrote the theory that I wrote 20 years earlier. Only I use this catchy phrase that you should start using. It's called survival of the fittest. You need to put that in your book. And Darwin does in the third edition of The Origin of Species. By the end of his life, he'll say that it was the stupidest decision he ever made. Because immediately, survival of the fittest was interpreted as the war of races against each other. Because that is the playing field that Josiah Knott had laid out for everybody in the whole world. Darwin deeply regretted it. And so he says natural selection will end up in extermination. But sexual selection, aha, here is a nicer mechanism. The Scent of Man is two volumes. The entire second volume is just set up to explain this thing called sexual selection. Here's sexual selection. Here's your science lesson for the day if you don't already know what this is. Here's sexual selection. Women choose. That's it. That's sexual selection. Women choose. Men have all kinds of crazy things about us. Women get to choose who they want to mate with. And they choose the same sorts of mates generation after generation which is how you get different races, says Darwin. All it has to do with is female choice. That's it. Some women want to choose men that have lighter colored skin. Some females want to choose men that have darker colored skin. And if that happens long enough, you get people that look different. But they are all commonly descended. So Charles Darwin, right? Huge scientist. People talk about him all the time father of evolutionary theory, and so on and so forth. Immediately everyone's convinced, right? Nope. Nobody's convinced. And what about the other thing? What about the whole religious backdrop to this whole discussion? People might not be convinced by Charles Darwin's scientific monogenism, but what about the religious stuff? What about the Adam and Eve story? Well, I told you, Josiah Knott realized that early on he was going to have to attack the Bible, if he was going to get anyone to be a polygenist. And sure enough, he says, clearly the Bible's not a scientific document. The Bible is not a scientific document, says Josiah Nott. So we shouldn't believe this. He goes one further. Arguing for polygenism, he says, is much like Galileo arguing for the sun to be at the center of the solar system. We we polygenists are fighting our way inch through inch through false theology. We all can see it. The last grand battle between science and dogmatism is about the origin of races. And you know, he says, science is going to win. Everyone's going to be a polygenist eventually. Maybe Charles Darwin wants to hold on to his religious sentiments. Yes, I just said that. Maybe Charles Darwin is so convinced by this religious argument that he wants to be a monogenist that the rest of us hard-nosed, tough-thinking, empirical scientists, we're all going to be polygenists. That's what we're going to be from now on. Now what happens in this debate between the monogenists and the polygenists is that the polygenists win. The polygenists win. It doesn't matter that Darwin is on the side of monogenism. By the time we get to the late 19th century, you get French theorists writing books, textbooks in anthropology saying, yes, it is true that there are people that are monogenistic, those orthodox people, but then there's people like me who are revolutionary, and we believe that races are permanent under present conditions, and consequently that they must originally have been multiple. And this book, by the way, is the first textbook in the field of anthropology which is adopted in universities all around the world. Now you might think, well, this is just one crank. Paul Topinard, who's this guy? What's he doing? Paul Topinard has an entire apparatus built around demonstrating polygenism. 
all these kinds of facial measurement things that work their way into crime theory as well as race theory. Stuff that has to do with the angle of the face and the shape of the nose and the size of the skull. There's lots of empirical evidence, says Paul Topinard, to defend polygenism. And Scotland Yard believes him. And the progenitor of the FBI believes him. And so these techniques get pulled into not just race theory and anthropology, but even criminology. Measure people's heads. If you want to know things about them, they will tell you the truth because they're measurements, they're objective. So that's what happens. And in fact, these arguments still exist today. 1998, this comes out, race is more than just skin deep. He says things like, look people, this stuff was already settled in the 19th century. Why do you insist on saying that race is only skin deep? We already know white people are superior. We already know what Knott and Glidden said. He actually spells his name wrong. I don't think you should trust anybody making theories about if they can't even get their names right, right? But he already says, in 1998, published in a mainstream peer-reviewed scientific journal, these ideas are still hanging around. They're definitely not the majority opinion anymore. They're a tiny, tiny minority. But the fact that not wrote this book back in the 19th century still has currency today. It still has currency. All right, let me finish up the story about not. What happens to him? Well, he does help found that building, the Medical College of the State of Alabama. But when Mobile is conquered by the Union in 1865, it's not supposed to be for medical education anymore. General Otis Howard, or Oliver Otis Howard, takes it over and makes it a freeman's school, which means there are former slaves that are in that school being taught stuff. And Josiah Knott has a conniption. I mean, he, he blows his stack. And he, he, he appeals first to Howard himself, then he appeals to the, the federal government, and he says, are you kidding me? My medical school is being defiled by having black people in the building? What are you talking about? He can't get any traction in the United States, so he ends up writing an article to his friends in London <laughs> at the Anthropological Review, and they do publish it. He's still saying this in 1866 at the end of his life. The Negroes by instinct opposed to labor, unable to function as free individuals. Am I almost out of time? Is that what you're trying to tell us? Oh, okay. <laughs> and so what happens is that he gets no traction. He doesn't get his medical school back. So he leaves. He leaves Alabama. He leaves for more fertile territory, namely New York City. I know, that's not what you were thinking I was going to say. But he goes to a more friendly place, someplace outside of Negro rule, he says, New York City. First he goes to Baltimore. It's not good enough. He goes to New York. Especially because his friend, J. Marion Sims, has gone from Montgomery to New York City to practice gynecology. And if you know the story of J. Marion Sims, you know that there's a lot of controversy around him right now. But he and Knott were buddies, and so Knott goes from being just a GP, just a general practitioner, to being a gynecologist, where he also will do this work. No, he's had no training in gynecology. But he and J. Marion Sims hang out in New York City. 1873, Knott gets pneumonia. He realizes that death is near, and he comes back to Mobile to settle his accounts, and he passes away. And we have a building named after him, folks. <laughs> 1923, Knott has been dead for 50 years, and the Board of Trustees for Alabama sits down to figure out what to call this brand new medical building, and somebody says, I don't know, let's call it after Josiah Knott, and everybody says, fine. And that's how it got named Knott Hall. Before that, it was called the medical building. There's no other, no other vote. But the funny thing is that Josiah not actually, if he was really invested in Alabama medicine, which is what a lot of historians who have tried to rehabilitate him have said, he sure doesn't behave like he cares that much about Alabama or Alabama medicine because the, Mo the Mobile Medical School opens again in 1868. His brother was still working in New Orleans. He could have come back. He could have continued to teach, but he doesn't. In fact, they say, please, 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 sir, you're the most well-known physician here. Can you please, please, please come back to the school? And he says, sorry, man, 
not going to do it. And so they struggle on for years and years and years. Eventually, uh, the medical school moves to Tuscaloosa, and then in 1945, it's only offering a two-year clinical program anywhere. There's no real medical college anywhere in Alabama until 1945, and then UAB is started from the remnants of the stuff that come out of that that comes out of that building. I guess that's I can stop there. Um, but uh, there are a whole bunches of more things that I can talk about with Josiah Knott. The point is that even though historians sometimes want to say that his real contributions were in medicine, the historical record demonstrates that Josiah Knott's real contributions were in race theory. And even it, when the, the headwinds were blowing, scientifically even, toward monogenism, Josiah Knott is the one who turns it around and has polygenism become the dominant theory on planet Earth at the time. And that is why people, in his time anyway, extolled Josiah Knott as the model physician from Alabama. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. <laughs> we have time for some questions. We only have one microphone today, but we're recording today's uh, session for our YouTube channel. So. If you would please raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll pass you the mic. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, the books that you mentioned, uh, Physical History of Mankind and Four Races of Men, as far as the language that's at you, did they write that for the general public or more like you said, a peer review type of language? There was no such thing as peer review. Oh. Um, not at that time, anyway. Not in the early 19th century. So, are you talking about James Cowles Pritchard's book, or are you talking about yeah, yeah? So that is actually written for a general audience, but also for a collegiate audience, so it's supposed to be both. And I mean, it, when it was two volumes, there weren't that many people that would have been interested in reading it by the time it was five volumes or even fewer people. <laughs> but but um, surprisingly, Pritchard's books were pretty widely read, at least among the British elite and among you know professors in the United States. So uh, sort of between is probably the right answer. Thank you so very much for sharing. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that Dr. Knott was really um, uh, a race theorist. My question is, particularly at that time, had there been any pushback? See, science was one of those things where you had a group of guys getting together yeah. and let's agree, right? right? And so over that was politics. Could you mention briefly about uh, those individuals who may have given not and his entourage a little pushback, especially from the black community or African uh, community at that time? Yeah, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, not didn't. In, I mean, do you do you know the answer to that question? Are you asking because you actually know the answer? No, I don't <laughs> okay. Know. Because because you, you're talking about the 1800s, yeah, 1850s. Um, yeah. You had um, you had the Chicago was back then. You had the, the Reconstruction was starting to come up in the 1860s and thereabouts. So I'm sure that there have been some. So if, um, if you mean in a general sense. Yeah, if you mean in a general sense, like the yeah. Chicago Defender wrote all the time right. saying this book is a piece of trash, right? right. But Josiah, not, I mean, first of all, um, he wouldn't have responded to anybody he didn't see as his peer. And he didn't think there were many people on earth that were his peers. And if there were any people on earth that were his peers, they were all in Europe anyway. Um, that's what, he traveled to Paris constantly because he thought that the, in, the intellectual environment was much more stimulating. And that's one of the reasons why you get Parisians repeating his ideas. And you get British people repeating his ideas, right? So, I mean, he was a very smart man, and I'm sure he was very persuasive, persuasive to talk to. But in terms of the pushback for him personally, he didn't receive any, really. Nationally, his biggest pushback were from pastors, uh, mostly from cities like Philadelphia and Boston and even New York. But and there was one prominent, um, man, I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head. There was one uh, prominent pastor from uh, Charleston, South Carolina, who said that, you know, you, you can't be a Christian and be a polygenist because clearly the Bible is saying that everybody, <laughs> everybody's related, right? And this is when not sort of takes on religion too and says, okay, if that's where we're going to go, then I'm going to make the other part of my career to be to try to discredit the scientific accuracy of the Bible. 
So if there was any pushback, Knott would not have seen it as somebody who was at the same level as him. So, but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, this is a side note, but I was just curious. The Spencer you mentioned, who argued the survival of the fittest onto Darwin, is he one of the originators of Christian identity theology that came out of England in that same time period? Christian identity theology. Now you're way outside of what I study. I'm going to say no, uh, only because Herbert Spencer was um, the guy who wrote about evolution before Charles Darwin. And most of his theories were psychological and soci sociological theory. He was a guy who thought that, for instance, um, humans had raised up over time from hunter-gatherers to planters to clans and eventually to statehood. He had lots of theories about technology. He's one of the guys that coined the term Stone Age to describe what he thought the tools were a long time ago. But he probably wouldn't have written anything about theology at all. He wrote a lot of books, though, so I could be wrong. There could be some out there that I don't know anything about. So my question is similar to your question in that in the early 20th century, you mentioned Hitler discovering this work. So had the monogenists come back uh, and kind of superseded at that point? Was he reaching back to some what is then kind of obscure, older work that fit with the the way he was thinking at that time? That's a great question. Yes and no. Um, the way that I like to explain it to my students is it's at, at, in about 1890, monogenism and polygenism do this. And you might think, well, that's impossible because they say opposite things. You have to choose one ancestor, we're all related, or multiple ancestors and we're not, right? But there is an in-between. Here's the in-between. We're all physically related, but mentally we're not. And that is the dominant uh, way that the proto-national socialist movement in Germany was already thinking. Uh, in fact, there's a group called the Tula Society, which Hitler himself is not a part of, but these are the, uh, some of the, um, I can't remember all their names, but uh, they're not just physicians and academics, they're also some corporate and industrial guys. And they are already, uh, subscribing to the stuff that's coming out of the 1880s and 1890s that's trying to, again, reassert white supremacy while allowing us to be physically related. Now, you can still see echoes of this today when, if you ever hear somebody say, oh, the reason why LeBron James is so good at basketball is because people of African descent have extra tendons, which allow them to jump higher than anybody else. Right, you hear that kind of stuff, that there's physiological differences between races, that's this kind of hang-on stuff from polygenism. That gets adopted into this, we'll call it monopolygenism stuff. And that will continue to hang on even to basically now in some communities. So it's a great question, though. I could teach a whole class on <laughs> the answer to that question. So glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my family had, I think probably in the mid 19th century, about five of six children who died as a result of yellow, yellow fever. fever. Yeah. And the thought was that they were too close. They're, they had settled on the Alabama River. So they, of course, blamed it on the mosquito, moved up to the crest of the hill in Lounsboro. And the one surviving daughter was very, very interested in what were the causes of yellow fever. And That's her great. son then was one of the founders of the university, the, the, the medical school down in, in the Mobile area. But my question goes back to, was malaria a problem, yellow fever a problem in the uh, low-lying areas in Alabama and could have the... American Indians been subject to having yellow fever? Wow, that's a great question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> well, here's what I can tell you. You actually, you sort of answered it in your question. Mal area, Latin, bad air. So the disease itself was thought to be tied to the air 
itself and inhaling bad fumes from the air. And people absolutely did believe that the worst air settled in the low places during the night. It's one of the reasons why there was, there's the old canard that you should never leave your windows open at night because the mall area might come in. And yellow fever was thought to be essentially the same kind of a thing. So they did believe that low-lying places, river valleys, were bad. And you just shouldn't live down there. Only the poor people would live down there. And if you had enough money, you would get up high. But that's not because they thought that mosquitoes or vectors were carrying disease as much as they thought that the air itself had disease in it. And so you had to get away from it as, as much as you could. But that, that's a fantastic story. As far as did Native Americans, were they subject to it? I'm sure they were. One massive difference between the way that Native Americans lived on the Gulf Coast versus the European settlers Native Americans were not, nomadic is not the right word, but they moved around a lot and they didn't concentrate in massive groups for very long periods of time. If you have anything that travels by mosquito, uh, you need lots of people to live in close proximity to one another for a long time, right? So though I'm sure, I'm sure that Native Americans did suffer from yellow fever and malaria, they just didn't live in big clumps in big houses for long periods of time and then suffer these die-offs the way that European immigrants did when they moved into the Gulf Coast region. All right, we have time for one last question and we'll walk over here. You've used uh, mainly uh, Western uh, theorists uh, about you know, re uh, the, the, the whole uh, issue here. Have you studied anything from uh, Asians and Africans on the same topic, uh, uh, what race theory was race, like? Race theory. Yeah, there is a little bit out there, but for the most part, um, the reason why what we think of as race theory emanates from Europeans, primarily people of European descent, is because that's who's doing the traveling around the world and entering in other people's lands. The only other time that we see this coming from any other society, really, is the Han Chinese in the 1600s and early 1700s uh, will travel all the way around the Indian Ocean down to Zanzibar on the, the East African coast and even down to Madagascar. And they do have this kind of theory about why people look differently. Interestingly, it's probably close to the truth that we think now, scientifically, their theory is that uh, people exposed to a lot of sunlight over time will just tend to get darker. And if you live in those environments, you'll, your children will also be dark. And if you live in an area where there's not as much sunlight, then you'll tend to be lighter. And if your children grow up in that sort of environment, they'll tend to be lighter too. Um, that, that's really it in terms of formal race theories. There are lots of just, you know, sort of folk race theories floating around, but you know, those are even things like, you were touched by the gods, and that's why you're a particular color, you know, things like that. So, anyway, it's a good question. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Peterson. Thank you. Fascinating, and thank, thank you, you all, all for coming today. <laughs>